Plants and animals are made up of cells, whether it's a giant sequoia tree, a blue whale, or an ant. Each being is composed of tiny building blocks called cells. In this video, we'll learn about the functional components that make up cells called organelles. We'll discuss the structures of organelles, their individual functions, and how they contribute to the overall function of the cell. Finally, we'll learn how the structural features of the cell enable organisms to capture, store, and use energy. If we look at the structure of a typical cell, we can see that it is surrounded by a thin layer called a plasma membrane, which is made of a type of lipid called a phospholipid. This membrane is what holds the cell together and controls the passage of substances in and out of the cell. Inside the membrane is a substance called cytosol, in which all the other structures or organelles are held, and which acts as a media through which substances can diffuse and pass throughout the cell. We'll discuss the plasma membrane in much more detail in another video. In this video, we're going to focus on organelles, which are functional structures within eukaryotic cells. We start our exploration of the eukaryotic cell in the nucleus. The nucleus can be considered as the information center because it houses genetic information in the form of DNA. The nucleus is made of three main components, the nuclear envelope, chromatin, and the nucleolus. The nuclear envelope consists of a double membrane, each made up of a lipid bilayer. Within this lipid bilayer, the nuclear envelope contains pore complexes that regulate the travel of proteins and RNA in and out of the nucleus. The shape of the nuclear envelope is maintained by a structural component called the nuclear lamina. The nuclear lamina is made up of protein structures known as intermediate filaments that form a web on the inside of the envelope. DNA is located inside the nucleus. Here, DNA is wrapped like thread around spool-like proteins called histones to form chromosomes. The DNA and proteins that form chromosomes are together referred to as chromatin. Chromatin remains dispersed in the nucleus until the cell is preparing to divide when it condenses. We will discuss cellular division more in future videos. The nucleolus is the portion of the nucleus where the building blocks for ribosomes are formed. Within the nucleolus, ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, is created from specific genes. Proteins that enter the nucleus from the cytoplasm combine with this rRNA to create the large and small subunits of ribosomes. These subunits then exit the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm, where they combine to create ribosomes, our next stop on our tour of the cell. Ribosomes synthesize proteins according to the specific instructions of messenger RNA. Messenger RNA, known as mRNA, is a single-stranded RNA molecule that contains the genetic instructions for manufacturing a protein. Ribosomes fall into two categories. Free ribosomes are located in the cytoplasm where the proteins created by free ribosomes tend to function. Bound ribosomes exist on the nuclear envelope or on the endoplasmic reticulum, in which case it becomes the rough endoplasmic reticulum as the presence of ribosomes gives the endoplasmic reticulum a coarse appearance under the microscope. These bound ribosomes create proteins that will be used within membrane-bound organelles in the cell, or packaged for use outside of the cell in a process called secretion. Ribosomes are not considered organelles because they are not bound by a membrane. The cells of all living creatures contain ribosomes, supporting the theory of common ancestry. This takes us to our next stop, the endomembrane system. The endomembrane system refers to several membrane-bound organelles, including the nuclear envelope, which we've already discussed, the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus, responsible for transportation and maturation of proteins, digestive organelles called lysosomes, vesicles, and finally, the plasma membrane of the cell itself. The endoplasmic reticulum is a vast network of membranes folded into flattened pouches called cisternae. The outer layer of the nuclear envelope is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. There are two different types of endoplasmic reticulum, the rough ER, as just mentioned, and the smooth ER. As we mentioned before, the rough ER contains ribosomes. These ribosomes are scattered across its surface, making it appear rough under a microscope. The primary function of the rough ER is to create proteins, either for use within the endomembrane system or to be secreted for use outside of the cell. 
These secretory proteins are called glycoproteins, which are proteins with carbohydrates attached. Proteins leaving the endoplasmic reticulum travel and transport vesicles to their final destination. The rough ER also creates phospholipids that will become vesicles and membranes for other organelles. We'll see in more detail in later videos how the nucleus works together with ribosomes in the rough ER to create proteins. But for now, here's a quick overview. In the nucleus, DNA is transcribed into mRNA. The mRNA then enters the rough ER and is translated into a protein by the ribosomes. This is how gene expression takes place. The messenger RNA acts as an intermediary between the information encoded by the DNA and the proteins that carry out the cell's functions. The smooth ER does not contain ribosomes. The smooth ER contains enzymes that help to detoxify poisons, synthesize lipids, and break down carbohydrates. The smooth ER also stores calcium ions, which are essential for protein secretion and maintaining concentration gradients, which are also vital for functions of specialized cells like muscle cells and neurons. The Golgi apparatus, also referred to as the Golgi body, is often compared to a mailroom or the shipping and receiving center of the cell. Vesicles that bud off from the endoplasmic reticulum enter the cis Golgi, or what we can think of as the receiving end. The transport vesicle fuses with the Golgi body and empties its contents into the cisternae of the Golgi. The materials from the endoplasmic reticulum will move from the cis side of the Golgi to the trans side, undergoing modifications until they are ready to leave the trans side or the shipping end. These modifications might include, for instance, adding sugary carbohydrates to the protein, making it a glycoprotein. Some proteins are tagged with phosphate groups or additional amino acid motifs, allowing them to be sorted and packaged before they exit the trans Golgi and are sent to specific locations if needed. In addition to modifying the products from the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi creates long chain carbohydrates called polysaccharides that will be destined for the plasma membrane. Some of the vesicles leaving the trans Golgi will return to the cis Golgi where their contents will aid the function of the Golgi apparatus. Other products will travel via vesicles to other organelles or to the plasma membrane for secretion. Let's now talk about lysosomes. These are membrane-bound vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes, which are enzymes that can digest large molecules. One purpose of lysosomes is to break down the cell's old macromolecules and recycle the parts for future use. This process is known as autophagy, or self-eating. Lysosomes also break down foreign substances in a process called phagocytosis, which is, of course, very useful for cells in our immune system, which can eat and destroy harmful bacteria or other pathogens. The inside of a lysosome is acidic compared to the relatively neutral pH of the cytosol. The enzymes in lysosomes operate well at this acidic pH. If a lysosome ruptures, the enzymes won't cause significant damage in the cytosol because they do not operate well at the neutral pH. However, if many lysosomes empty their contents into the cytosol, the cell will self-destruct. If a cell is damaged beyond repair, the lysosomes will conduct this process of cell death, which is known as apoptosis. However, cells can also undergo programmed cell death or apoptosis normally as part of development or to balance cell numbers in adult tissues. Immune cells can also instruct cells to undergo apoptosis as part of the immune response, if the cell is infected. Vacuoles are vesicles that come from the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi body. Vacuoles have many purposes. In animal cells, for example, they store and release macromolecules and waste products. A common type of vacuole in many protists is the food vacuole, which contains food that the unicellular organism has engulfed. Lysosomes fuse with the food vacuole and then digest its contents. Plant cells often contain what is called a large central vacuole. This vacuole contains water and regulates the size and stiffness of the plant by maintaining hydrostatic pressure in the cell. There is often only a small amount of cytosol between the central vacuole and the cell wall. The pressure against the cell wall caused by the water tension in the central vacuole is known as turgor pressure. Turgor pressure helps with the shape and stability of the plant cell, and therefore the plant as a whole. Mitochondria are critical to eukaryotic cell function because they make energy for the cell. 
through a process called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is the process of generating usable chemical energy in the form of a molecule called ATP by breaking down fuels such as sugars, but also lipids and proteins. Almost all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria, but some cells have more than others. Muscle cells, for example, have very high energy needs and therefore have a greater density of mitochondria. Mitochondria have an outer and an inner membrane, similar to the nucleus discussed earlier, each one formed by the same phospholipid bilayer structure that we see in the cell membrane. We can see that the inner membrane is highly folded, with many infoldings called cristae. The folds provide the inner membrane with a large surface area on which ATP can be generated. The two membranes divide the mitochondrion into two different chambers, each of which performs different functions. The inner chamber is called the mitochondrial matrix, while the outer chamber is called the intermembrane space. The matrix contains many enzymes that carry out the reactions of cellular respiration. The Krebs cycle, also known as a citric acid cycle, is a series of metabolic reactions that takes place in the mitochondrial matrix, which, without going into detail, process fuel biomolecules into usable precursor molecules for respiration. Further steps of cellular respiration are carried out by enzymes embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. This inner membrane is the site of a sequence of protein enzymes that make up the electron transport chain and that synthesize ATP. This is why the many folds of the membrane enhance energy production, giving more surface area to accommodate as many enzymes as possible. And we'll be going into much more detail about cellular respiration in future videos. While animals get their energy from food, plants and some other organisms, such as algae, have the ability to use sunlight to generate their own energy from carbon dioxide and water in a process called photosynthesis. To do this, they use an organelle called a chloroplast. Chloroplasts contain a green pigment, chlorophyll, which absorbs light and is what gives leaves their green color, since that is the only part of the light that gets reflected. Photosynthesis occurs through a series of steps in different parts of the chloroplast. If we take a closer look at the chloroplast, we can see that it contains stacks of membranous structures called thylakoids. Each stack of thylakoids is called a granum. The membranes of these grana are the site of the light-dependent part of photosynthesis, where photons of light are converted into chemical energy. This is also the first part of photosynthesis. Here, photons of light strike light-absorbing units called photosystems, which consume water and use chlorophyll to pass energy down an electron transport chain. This process generates ATP in the precursors of the Calvin cycle, which is the second light-independent step of photosynthesis. Surrounding the chloroplast is a double layer of membranes. Inside those membranes, but outside the thylakoids, we find the stroma. The stroma is a fluid which contains enzymes and is where the Calvin cycle takes place. The Calvin cycle picks up where the light reactions left off. It uses carbon dioxide and the products of the light reactions to synthesize glucose, a sugar, and other compounds that can then be used as energy stores or structural components by plants. It's worth noting that glucose also serves as a food source for the many beings that consume plants, including humans. Photosynthesis is therefore a crucial part of ecosystems and sustains life as we know it.